Okay, I see about 15 attendees. So I think we, um, we can get it started. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Bia. I'm the Assistant Division Manager with Alice Sanitation. Today is Wednesday, um, October 25th. Today um, is our third of our series six, six events for the Technical Tech Talks uh, Engineering Series. Today we have, um, you know what, let me go ahead and share my presentation. That will probably be better. So let me go ahead and share my presentation. There we go. All right, panelists, can you see the uh, presentation that I have? All right. Yeah. Okay. Not, it's okay. All right. Well, let's do it over again. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Ellison Tech Talks. Uh, today is our third in the series of six. Uh, today is October 25th. Uh, today we have Ms. Sarah Garcia and Mr. Ola Hernandez from Watershed Protection Division. And my name is Ryan Dia. I'm the Assistant, Div Assistant Division Manager with the uh, Early sanitation. So before we kick off the presentation, there are a few housekeeping rules. Uh, if you'll be kind enough to please change your name to add your school abbreviation behind it. For example, Jane Doe slash UCLA, if you're from UCLA, that way it's easier for us to keep track of your attendance. And uh, when you ask questions, we'll be able to uh, follow up uh, appropriately. Uh, another thing is we have a Q&A section. Uh, questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. You can either raise your hands and also use a Q&A button um, at the end of your screen to type in your uh, questions. Um, after the Q&A, we'll have some briefing um, and information on the hiring. So another thing, the last, lastly, anyone um, exhibiting unprofessional behavior will be removed and reported to Zoom as well as your school. So please be uh, respectful to the presenters and um, uh, exercise your professionalism. This uh, information will be, presentation will be recorded. Uh, it will be made available online. And at the end of the, the uh, presentation, you will receive an email with all the information that we have today. So before we go into the presentation, please allow me to introduce the two speakers today. Um, Oval, uh, Mr. Oval Hernandez Marshall is a professional engineer uh, registered in the state of California. He is an acting civil engineer with the Watership Protection Division. A uh, graduate of US, uh, California State University from um, with the uh, degree in civil engineering, uh, graduated in 2014, and he went ahead and got his master's degree in civil engineering and water resources from uh, Cal State LA as well. He is a proud recipient of Defer Action for Childhood Arrival. So um, he's worked um, in a lot of nonprofit organizations, such as uh, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineer, uh, working as a director of uh, student outreach, and he remains actively involved with those activities. Um, he works at the public counter, low impact development counter, uh, that reviews and approves the construction plans for stormwater mitigation, including the projects such as the LAFC Stadium and other major projects that you will see in the presentation. Uh, those, pro those, those projects basically include the stormwater components in every project that the city allows um, city, city permits to, to, uh, to build. Uh, the next presenter we have is Ms. Sarah Garcia. She's an environmental engineering associate with um, Watershed Protection Division, graduate of uh, CSUN in 2011 with a degree in Bachelor in Civil Engineering. And she also holds a master's degree um, in structural engineering. So Sarah started her career in the city, uh, Department of Building and Safety, where she learned about the building codes. She has a very uh, in-depth knowledge in the structural engineering principle. Um, and then she transferred to LA Center to work at the uh, low impact development LID counter, where she reviews and approves the plan for the stormwater mitigation. So with that, I will um, hand it over to you, um, Sarah and Oval, for your presentation. I'm gonna stop my share at this moment. There you go. And while we're pulling up the presentation, please, uh, all the attendees, uh, go ahead and change your name with the school abbreviation at the end of your name so we can better follow up uh, uh, with your questions. So please go ahead and do so if you haven't done so. Thank you.
Um, okay, great. Thank you, Ryan, for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, uh, or um, myself uh, and Sarah will be speaking today. Um, and so our presentation is on watersheds uh, and how um, our division and our section specifically uh, protects our watersheds. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so the city of LA essentially has um, this water management plan, um, which, and if you see on the screen there, this is the delineation of the watershed that um, the city of LA oversees. Um, <clears throat> there are essentially five different sub watersheds um, that we take part in, uh, Bayona Creek, Dominguez Hills, uh, Marina del Rey, uh, LA River, uh, and the Santa Monica Bay. And so there are multiple jurisdictions that are that take part in this watershed, and so we work alongside them. Um, we work alongside with the county of LA, um, different cities like Santa Monica, Culver City, uh, and any of the surrounding cities that feed into these various watersheds. Uh, and so we must align with um, what they're doing uh, to meet our goals specifically as well. Uh, next slide. And so um, the. The, these um, regulations are governed um, by both federal and state and local agencies. Um, this federal regulation started with the enactment of the Clean Water Act in 1972, which ultimately created uh, the EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and those that agency further uh, required the state and local levels to create their, or, their own ordinances and guidelines, uh, depending on the needs of the state and the city that they're in. Uh, and so that's why we're governed by the California Regional, Quad uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, which issues and reviews um, uh, NPDES permits. Um, and so if you've ever walked around the city of LA, you've likely seen um, this stencil um, that's, that reads, no dumping drains to ocean. Uh, and so that's included as part of one of the regulatory items. Um, and so that's a requirement by the city of LA. Uh, and also at LID at our own counter, we require that this be installed on private properties um, whenever there is a catch basin that drains to the ocean. Uh, and essentially all of this runoff, um, you, what you want to do is prevent as much runoff from entering these storm drain lines, retaining it on site um, before it discharges to the ocean. Next slide. Uh, and so the city of LA runs on a separate uh, stormwater and sewer system. Um, and so a lot of this is to mitigate the uh, flooding that, occur that has occurred historically in the city of LA. Uh, and so that's why a lot of, uh, that's why all of our open channels are concrete. Um, it's to divert all that runoff um, directly to the ocean to minimize um, how much flooding occurs in the city of LA. Uh, and so now that we've alleviated that issue, um, our next goal is to retain that runoff on site. Uh, and so preventing a lot of that runoff from leaving the property. Uh, and so we do that by various um, systems that are installed on private property and also regional projects. Um, so the private property aspect, Sarah, will go over uh, later in the presentation. Um, but as far as regional projects, that's something that um, the Bureau the Bureau of Sanitation, specifically our division handles. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, we do work with a lot of other jurisdictions, uh, including the city, the county, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and Caltrans to maintain these numerous systems that uh, control the stormwater runoff. Um, and so one of the ways that we do this is by providing uh, an enhanced watershed management plan. And so of the five watersheds that I mentioned, each one has a specific plan based on its specific location. Uh, and so as you can imagine, the watersheds um, are located in various cities through, throughout and have various contaminants that drain into it, depending on the surrounding areas. Some are more residential areas, um, while some are um, heavily surrounded by industrial facilities. And so you can imagine that the runoff that's generated into them um, varies. And so say you have a lot of residential, you potentially have a lot of landscaping. Uh, and so you have a lot of pesticides that run off into these watersheds. And so there has to be a management plan to mitigate those pesticides and reduce the amount of pesticides that lead into these rivers. Because the main goal is to divert um, as much runoff from entering these systems. Uh, and then once they do to mitigate uh, how much is allowed to enter. Uh, 
the purpose there is to um, reuse these recreational systems um, for recreational use. As you can see uh, in the photo, that's Mayor Eric Garcetti um, rowing down the LA River. And so um, what you want to build is an, uh, a system that allows for these watershed um, channels to be used uh, for recreational use and have a multi-use system. Um, and so the way that we fund these programs um, are very, by passing various measures uh, and propositions. Uh, so Prop O and Measure W are two of our main ones. Uh, and so the, the next slide will show one of the projects that um, was funded by Prop O. Uh, and so that was the uh, Echo Park Lake rehabilitation. Um, so as you can see, those are construction photos of Echo Park Lake. Uh, and those were heavily funded by Prop O and continue to be funded in its maintenance. Um, and so as you can see, this was used um, as for multiple purposes. Um, it's used for flood, flood control. It retains a lot of the runoff um, at the lake facility. Um, it's also recreational use. Um, if you ever get a chance to go there, you can rent boats and kind of ride around the, the lake. Um, it's a nice uh, it's a nice area to go to. Um, and so it's also recreational use. So these are multi beneficial uh, for the community that it surrounds. Um, next slide. Um, and so you ideally also want to not just build these, um, you want to build these throughout the city so that um, you can have these areas located throughout the city and manage as much runoff as possible. Uh, and ideally you want to convert an area that's potentially um, a light, slightly more pollutant and change that into a, a resourceful area. And so you can see here that um, a parking a uh, parking lot and uh, industrial facility was converted into a park. Uh, and so the area that it's actually located in is in South LA, which doesn't have too many parks. It doesn't have too many areas of recreational use. And so once again, it becomes a very um, multi-beneficial system, um, especially to the surrounding community. Uh, and so now Sarah will speak on low impact development and what we do at, at, at our public counters. Um, all right, thanks, Orva. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. So um, today I'm going to be talking briefly about our low impact development, which is the LID counter. So the stormwater regulations came into effect to the city of LA on the 12th of May of 2012. And the design of the stormwater uh, BMPs is basically based on the 85th percentile, which is the 24 hour runoff. And that is determined from the LA County 85th percentile. And as you can see, this is just an example of what the map looks like. Oops. Right. <laughs> and um, so at the counter, we do issue a lot of projects. As you can see, when we first started, um, the number of projects were lower and they have been continuously increasing per year as the graph shows. However, we experienced a little bit of a drop and that was because of the pandemic but we are back to issuing more projects than we ever did. And then in the fiscal year of 2021, 2022, we issued a total of 5,559 projects. And then for, um, for our counter, the we do over counter reviews and these projects are residential developments. They usually cons, um, consist of an addition or construction of up to four units or less on the lot. And the applicant could choose um, any of the BMPs that we have to utilize them. So as you can see here, we have options of rain barrels um, and then rain tanks, which are above ground. They can choose to do something like dry wells and filtration trenches, which is um, under the ground. They could also choose um, something different like the permeable pavers or a planter box or a rain garden. So they can choose whatever option that they see that works best for them. And you can see here on this slide, so this is a construction of a planter box for um, a residential development, which it was a house. So you could see all the way to the left, we have a picture of the shell of the planter. So this is how we kind of like to see these pictures, um, the progress pictures and how they're constructed. So the first picture is just the core and you can see a perforated pipe going through. And then if you go to the second middle picture, there is waterproofing, there is gravel, you can see the overflow pipe. 
And the last picture is how we like to see the planter box fully constructed with the plants, with the inlet, um, the downspout and the overflow. So that was one of um, our good examples that we've got at the counter. And then um, we also, on the other hand, we have uh, projects that we consider or classify them as large scale. And these are commercial industrial projects, um, apartments that are more than four units and so forth. So for these projects, they're not reviewed on the spot as we take them in. And they are treated a little bit differently because um, the applicant cannot just choose whatever BMP they like to propose. They would have to go through a hierarchy of BMPs. So the first option that they would have to explore would be infiltration. And that would be something like infiltration trenches, dry wells, permeable paver, detention chambers, infiltration basins, and so on. Um, however, if this first option is deemed infeasible due to site conditions or whatnot, then the applicant could go ahead and explore the second option, which would be um, a capture and, uh, and use option. And that could be in the form of above the ground rain tanks or underground cistern or a permavoid system. But if that option as well um, has been deemed infeasible, then they could move to our last option, which would be the high efficiency biofiltration, which could be something like a planter box like we previously discussed or um, vegetated swales. And then um, for the large scales, I just uh, wanted to touch up upon, upon this. So this is um, a picture of a dry well. So it's typically one of um, the common BMPs for a large scale project. And the reason why it's common also is because due to one of its properties, which gives it a great advantage as a dry well is drilled deep enough in the soil. So it can bypass the low permeability rate soil media and reach into a more favorable soil with a high percolation rate. And since it is underground, so it does not take space out of the surface area of the project, but then they could still meet our requirements for the storm water. And um, last but not least, um, I just want to talk about this. So this is actually is a project that is under construction and we're currently working on it. This is the George Lucas Museum. So it's, um, it's a pretty big project as the lot area itself consists of 14.2 acres, uh, 5.6 acres of which are impervious. And these impervious areas were treated with various BMPs, some of which were actually a total of three dry wells, four cisterns and infiltration trench. And they also utilized some, um, some area for green roof as well. And then um, like mentioned, this project is currently under construction, which is good. Uh, for us because it does allow the staff to review like the process for the installation of the BMPs and that would be it for today. All right, so what? Thank you, Sarah and Oho. Um, let me go through the screen and see if we have any questions. So I'm going to um, put up my previous slide back on, on the screen. So give me a second while I manage to do that. All right, well, thanks again, Sarah and Oval for a very informative presentation. Um, I'm gonna take a look and um, continue to monitor and see if we have any upcoming questions. Um, let me manage my screen really quick. So, um, while I'm going through that, I want to also talk about the uh, employment opportunities at the uh, LA Sanitation. So starting off with a typical environmental engineering associate for um, at the LA Sanitation, you know, some of the requirements and some of the benefits. So um, currently the annual starting salary is going around $85,000 uh, plus 
annual increases such as cost of living and bonuses. Uh, it goes through engineering associate one, two, three, and four through uh, interviews and promotions. Um, some of the requirements to be the uh, to uh, to become a candidate for the environmental engineering associate is uh, one of them is you have to have a bachelor's master's degree. Uh, most importantly, you should be working on engineering training EIT uh, as a part of the employment with this with the city or uh, with LA sanitation is for you to complete your EIT within the first two and a half years of your employment in order for you to uh, stay employed. So this is very important and we recommend all the candidates to start working on the EIT while the information is fresh. Um, or if you already have the professional professional engineering degree, uh, PE, um, that's satisfying pretty much all the requirements. Additional requirements, you must be at least 18 years old, uh, have a proof of identity and legal right to work in the US. And as I said, EIT is required within three years of being hired. It is a hybrid position. Um, you do have to still come into the, to, to the field and the office although we have a telecommuting option available. So your residency should be within the drivable, reasonable drive, uh, distance away from, uh, from your work site. And uh, lastly, the COVID uh, vaccination is also required. So the next one is the student engineer position. This is for the students that are full-time uh, pursuing their career. Uh, um, uh, uh, finishing up their degrees. You must be a full-time student. Uh, it is not an internship program. Uh, it is a student engineer position who will work continuously throughout the graduation. Again, you know, for any employment with the city, COVID vaccination is required. Uh, you will be allowed to work up to 950. You can work up to 950 hours. So that's about part-time uh, working 20 hours a week. And we have a pretty flexible schedule. We work with your schedule. If you have midterms or, or final that you need to take time off, you can make up those hours throughout the year. Um, um, and um, starting salary could be somewhere from $20.77 to uh, $32 per hour. And um, it depends on your standing. If you're a freshman, sophomore, senior, uh, junior or senior, uh, your, your hourly rate varies based on your you're standing at, at your school. It is also a hybrid position and uh, you must be located within a commutable distance from the city of Los Angeles or your job site. Um, so that's true in the engineering position. Um, sanitation participate in a lot of conferences, uh, Society of Women Engineer. Um, it is pending approval, uh, NSBE, Society of His, um, Hispanic Professional Engineer, National and Regional, they, uh, we successfully completed engineering day uh, a couple of weeks, uh, um, a weekend ago, uh, it was well attended and we received a lot of uh, applications. So we're going through the evaluation process. Um, every year we do this, it is free, um, free via Zoom and you can also uh, have our in-person attendance. We are also conducting on campus interviews um, at UCLA for the fall engineering, uh, conducting tech fair as well, Cal State, uh, intention and career expo. I think overall you were you were there giving the presentation. So thanks for doing that. UCR, HPE, uh, Power Branch event. And if you don't have any information, if you want more information, you can check with your career center for uh, more information for employment with the uh, City of Los Angeles, uh, at least annotation. And um, in the uh, information below at the bottom of the presentation, you will you can join our mailing list. Uh, you will receive uh, email updates from Project Green Leadership PGL uh, uh, regarding the uh, recruitments and other job opportunities. This is the information for you to download. Um, you can go to your career center uh, at your school uh, and you can use your school handshake system to, to get the application uh, information. When you go to the conferences, please bring an application or a resume and bring, bring them to, to our uh, information booth. And I just um, mentioned about our engineering day that's recently completed. Um, let me see what else. Oh, I also wanted to highlight, you know, four distinct programs that sanitation has. We have clean water program, which basically covers wastewater, um, um, sewer infrastructure with full water regulation plants. We have industrial management, water recycling implementation, and wastewater engineering. So 
we have Hyperion Water Reclamation Plan, which is one of the largest in the nation, um, located in South Bay. We have Donald C. Tillman Water Reclamation Plan located in the Valley, uh, LA Glendale Water Reclamation Plan located in the uh, close to across the river from um, LA Zoo. Uh, we also have Terminal Island Water Reclamation Plan in San Pedro. So those are four exciting water reclamation plans location where we're hiring as well. We have an industrial management division that um, looks at all the discharges related to uh, industrial um, uh, users, uh, businesses, and industry. Um, water reclamation recycling implementation is the division that is looking at how to fully recycle all the wastewater or all the reclaimed water within the sanitation being produced within, within the city of Los Angeles, uh, produced by 4 million residents. And you know, as Sarah and Oval indicated, stormwater is also another big component of it. Watershed Protection Division and Safe Clean Water Program are two divisions. Another stormwater program taking care of our public health and environment related to the stormwater and making sure that we also provide reliable groundwater recharge from those uh, stormwater that we capture. And another big, big um, section under the uh, sanitation is solid resources group that deals with basically the trash that we throw away from um, homes and businesses. We have a curbside pickup processing and uh, construction in divisions and solid resources support. So those are, you know, the same, um, the same uh, uh, residents, 4 million residents that city of Los Angeles has, we, we take care of all the trash. Um, of course, you know, other supporting divisions include executive uh, division, customer care. We have 24 seven customer care that you can call using 311 and provide, um, uh, ask for assistance from us any day of any time of the day. We have a financial management division and regulatory affairs division because we are one of the most uh, regulated um, entities because we deal with the public health and environment. So those are the uh, four branches within the uh, LA Sanitation. Uh, I also wanted to share the, the faces of our project leadership. If you'll probably see either Deanna or Anya, both of them at the information booth or when you send an email, um, very, very um, um, personable uh, from, from our team. So you know, if you have any information, please feel free to reach out to them directly as well, Adi and Deandra. And also wanted to recap um, what we just talked about today by Oval and, and Sarah. We talked about public counter, how we looked at the, uh, the stormwater and climate change from a different perspective. Um, you know, this is where one of the areas where you have to, you should have a good customer service and technical knowledge. And uh, it's not one of the things that, you know, we kind of get exposed or learn in school, one of the soft skills that you have to <clears throat> develop over time. Um, and last year, you know, last week we talked about presentation skills, soft skills that you need to you need to uh, develop when you pick up a career at the city. So this is, you know, another highlight of a very diverse background that we we all have. Um, uh, you probably see, you know, maybe up to um, fifty customers a day at, at any given time, and and you know, uh, um, you have to be a good, good uh, communicator. You have to be patient. You have to be able to um, understand uh, people's frustration and be able to uh, assist city's residents with the uh, with those kind of line of work. So uh, again, thanks uh, Sarah and Oval for having that dedication and mindset. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pull up the Q&A and see if there's any questions. Um, the first one that I see is from ISIL. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, the question is, I have a question regarding the draining process. How are we going to get people not to use pesticides? So I'll hand it over to Ola and Sarah to uh, provide an answer for that. Yeah, and so there's different contaminants that the city of LA has to look at for their various water bodies. Uh, and so these are governed again by the state uh, and by the local levels. Um, and so these are classified uh, on a certain list that the city of LA receives every year from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Uh, and they're listed as TMDLs. So it's the total maximum daily load 
that a water body can receive of a certain contaminant to still uh, meet certain standards. Uh, and so the testing that's done at the rivers is there to identify um, whether a certain water body is being affected by a certain pollutant more than another or if it's exceeding that pollutant. Uh, and so in the event that there is a contaminant that's exceeding, we have to identify the source of that contaminant. Uh, and we do have um, officers, environmental officers, that go out to these facilities to investigate um, potentially where these contaminants are um, draining from. Uh, and sometimes they're cited because of that uh, infringement that they're causing on that water body. And so that's one of the ways that we do it. Um, and so depending on the contaminant itself, there are certain ordinances or regulations that are imposed um, on certain facilities or residents um, for the for the uses of certain contaminants um, and their uh, correct disposal to prevent from the from that contaminant to prevent that contaminant from reaching the water body um, that it's currently affecting. Thanks, Oval. Just wanted to also add on Oval's points. You know, when you're talking about pesticides, we have. Um, legacy pesticides such as DDT, PCB, PAHs, which are no longer permitted to use in the U.S., but they still persist in the environment because they never go away. So, you know, um, regulations were passed to, to uh, stop the use of those. Um, we still have to take care of them. You know, if you go to Palos Verdes Shelf, um, there's a dead zone because a long time ago, um, there was a spill uh, from an industry that basically dumped uh, thousands of gallons of DDTs and ended up there creating dead zone. Um, <clears throat> the other one is the emerging contaminants. You know, some of the things are, uh, I guess, uh, the the household pesticides that you typically find at uh, local hardware stores like fipronols and um, other things that are that have a very short uh, half-life, but that are very effective in, you know, messing with uh, killing the aquatic uh, life. So, so there's a uh, statewide um, uh, uh, committee that looks at those. Um, one example is, you know, we've had a lot of uh, uh, copper uh, in the water bodies and sediments that are causing the uh, toxicity. So states successfully passed the copper brake pad. The, the copper, you know, the most contributors from, well, copper is from the cars. When you break the coppers, the copper particles um, basically gets on the ground uh, on the streets and then when it washes off it and they end up in, in the uh, river. So um, the state was successfully able to reduce the copper content by 95% in the last 15 years. And you can see the rejection in the, uh, the water bodies. So that's one success that we've, we've seen with, with the, uh, not a pesticide, but you know, heavy metal that was causing the, uh, the environmental help uh, in, our, in our ecosystem. So, you know, a lot of work to do. Um, public outreach is another thing that we actively participate and engage in. So, um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, so we'll move on to the next one. This is from Michelle from UCI. Uh, I guess to both uh, Sarah and Oval. The question is, what is your favorite project that you've worked on while at LA Sands? So I'll kick it up to Sarah first and then Oval, you can maybe chime in later on. Oh, okay. Uh, hi. So honestly, my favorite project that I worked on was the Starbucks across from where I lived previously, <laughs> because uh, it was really cool to just be able to walk over and I knew there was like an underground cistern. Uh, I knew the plants every time I looked at them, I knew that they were watered by this underground cistern. Um, and it just so happened that I was involved in during um, the plan check process and the construction when they came. So I was almost aware of all the process and even the hurdles that they met, not just um, for the storm water, but also for, um, you know, other departments or other permits that they needed to get and why they were delayed and whatnot. So to me, that was like the coolest project I worked on. Uh, for me, it's uh, two, I guess. Um, I think, as I mentioned in my bio, the LAFC Stadium. Um, 
I think it was really nice to be able to go out to the site and see the stadium itself before it was um, kind of open to the public. Um, I've had a chance to also do that with the Lucas Museum. Um, and so when you do go out to these sites, you do kind of sign waivers to not disclose photos of the facility before they open. Um, so it's really cool to see a lot of these developments go up. Um, and then you get to learn about different aspects of the facility itself. Uh, and so, for example, going out to the George Lucas facility, um, there are um, the the structure itself is really um, tall. Um, and, and it goes up really high. And so they have to take into account the seismic activity that occurs. Um, and so they have um, seismic dampers that are installed on the side of the buildings. And so you can see them during the construction process. Um, they're about 10 to 20 feet wide. Um, and so at the end of the construction, that's some, not something that you'll be able to see that'll be visible um, on site. But during the construction, you can see um, their construction, their installation, uh, and also understand its purpose. Uh, and so you can walk around with the other technical staff that were involved with the project. Um, so the structural engineers and the soils engineers that took place uh, and that took part in the approval process for the project and understand kind of their involvement with the project. Uh, and you can see how the stormwater elements also affect their design. Um, for a facility like that, when you're infiltrating water into the ground, you do want to keep it away from the structure itself so that you're not affecting the structural stability of the building itself. Uh, and so these are things that you kind of get a chance to look at um, in person and discuss that with the technical staff there. And so um, I think for me, George Lucas, um, the George Lucas Museum is probably the my favorite one um, alongside the LAFC Stadium. Thanks, uh, Sarah and Oval. So I have a follow-up question. Seems like um, a lot of the project components that you know you guys approved are underground. Um, um, do you have any recommendations on like above ground facilities that people who are who are interested in may, maybe you know keep an eye out when they're in the area and look out for those uh, best management practices like bioswales or something that you know you can easily identify um, throughout in the city that that you 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 guys have worked on. Well, I think the as far as above grounds, it would be the planters or the barrels. I mean, the barrels are usually huge and then um, they're like darker in color. They're usually like a dark blue or a black, but also the planters. Um, I've seen a lot of the properties, obviously not all of them. They would put them in the front yard or the side. So if you're walking around, you could just easily see them. You could tell. Um, if the downspouts are directed to these planters, then you would know that these are planters for the storm water, um, not just for, you know, decoration. Um, I mean, I, that's what I usually personally see a lot, the planters or the barrels, but I think mostly the planters, so. Uh, and aside from that, I think one of the kind of emerging emerging BMPs that we're seeing a lot of are green roofs. Uh, and so, um, you know, if you're ever on a plane or you're kind of touching down into LA or you're on a high rise, um, you can kind of look down to lower buildings and you can see the green roof that's installed on these buildings. Uh, and so all the runoff, uh, all the rain that lands in that building is captured and maintained on the roof by the soil that's installed there. Um, obviously, sometimes they can't treat all of it or keep all of it, but it does reduce the amount of runoff that leaves the facility. Uh, and so green roofs are something that you you you've started we've started to see a lot of uh, and so green roofs are essentially a self-mitigating system um, so you don't need to provide another bmp uh, like a drywall or a cistern because everything's being retained within that landscaping that's installed uh, on that green roof element great um let me see we have another question do we have a way to properly dispose pesticides within a company? So I can take up that question. So city, city of Los Angeles offers uh, safe centers. Um, so we have a, a location throughout the city where you can dispose of your household hazardous waste. Um, I believe you just have to bring in your ID to make to show that uh, you live within the city and you can uh, call 311 uh, or go to LACitycenter.org and find out 
S A F E Safe Centers. Uh, we also have mo mobile collection events um, periodically. So those are the places and location where you can um, dispose your household hazardous waste, and that's where we will help you um, to properly dispose those those uh, waste that you no longer need. Um, that includes paints, you know, leftover paint cans, pesticides, uh, batteries, and such. Okay. All right. Um, we do have a few um, sometimes. So I, I I have a lot of questions too. You know, maybe uh, the attendees will also benefit. So we, when you take the water into the ground, where does it go? And do we have a way to measure how much water is going into our groundwaters, groundwater aquifers? Again, so those are specifically for the infiltration systems. Uh, and so for infiltration systems, um, the design of it um, is dependent on the site itself and where it's located. Um, certain sites receive uh, more runoff than others. Uh, and so as you get closer to the valley, the rainfall that's expected uh, is slightly higher. Um, and so that 85th percentile uh, storm event that Sarah mentioned earlier um, is a lot higher in the valley. So it's about 1.2 inches of runoff, um, as opposed to when you go down um, a little more south towards San Pedro, um, where it kind of drops down to 0.4. Um, and so those, um, those BMPs are sized to meet the capacity of the expected rainfall at those facilities or at those developments. Uh, and so that's the capacity aspect of it. And so that's how we can kind of measure how much runoff is retained on site. Um, for the groundwater levels, we do have to be a certain um, distance away from the uh, groundwater table. Um, one of the things that we don't wanna do is contaminate uh, the groundwater um, with these um, BMPs. And so they do go to through a filtration system before they're even discharged to this Say, say a dry well, uh, and then they go through even more filtration as they go through the soil before they ultimately reach uh, those groundwater tables. Uh, and so the volume that's generated is calculated annually um, based on the amount of rainfall that we received and the capacity that's um, that the BMP is constructed for. Okay. Thanks, Olin and Sarah. So, <clears throat> We have one follow-up question. This is also related to the, um, I believe the pesticides or the hazardous waste. The question is, do we have a place for companies to go since they dump to the sewers or storm drain? Um, I can you know, answer the question. We do have the industrial waste management division, which handles the, the waste that businesses generate. So if you uh, have a business license within the city, you will have to comply with the uh, hazardous waste and uh, discharge requirements. So dumping anything other than water into our storm drain system is prohibited. Uh, sewer system is strictly for household sewer from the sink and uh, uh, showers and bathtubs. Uh, you know, we should not be dumping pharmaceuticals or anything that is not that the, the current system is not designed to handle. So when you do, when you have a business in the city, those are the regulations that we have to follow. And uh, if you, you know, if businesses do not follow that, that's uh, breaking the law. And we do have an enforcement um, team that goes out and make sure that folks are in compliance and that uh, they do not uh, contribute to the uh, pollutions in our system. So, um, so that's my answer to the, the question. I don't know if uh, Oval or Sarah, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I agree. And then even when you've when you've had a chance, if you've had a chance to go out to Hyperion and taken a, a tour of the facility, sometimes the um, the managers and the facility staff will tell you some of the things that they do see and that they do receive. Um, and so there are ways to manage that as well. Um, and so it depends on where the contaminants are coming from. And sometimes they're um, in fact, just large bulks of trash that's um, diverted to those facilities. Um, if you've ever gone, you'll see stories that they'll tell you that there's tires that are discharged um, to the sewer system, um, couches, mattresses. Uh, and so these are very unfortunate things that uh, kind of occur uh, in the city. Um, in the city, and so we do have a ways to manage it. And so they do have ways of preventing that from actually re reaching or affecting the treatment system uh, that occurs at the Hyperion treatment plant. Um, and then that's further recycled. 
um, and uh, disposed of properly before it ever discharges out to the ocean or before it affects um, the treatment system that's um, occurring at the facility. Thanks, Oval. Um, another question is, do you think we could collect the particles that could harm the ocean from our storm drains or sewers? Um, sorry, would you mind elaborating on that? Sure. Um, I guess, you know, if, there, if, if there's a way to collect the pollutants that goes into our storm drain and sewer system that will end up in the ocean, is there a way to collect and catch, you know, um, I guess that's, that's a BMP that you were mentioning about. That's mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, and so the a lot of the runoff that's retained on site is actually st staying on site. And so before um, any runoff is directed to a proposed BMP, um, it's actually filtered, um, and then um, those contaminants are removed before it affects the BMP. The BMP itself is sometimes a, a treating system, so like a biofiltration system that um, those potential contaminants are retained uh, within that BMP, and then there's a maintenance system um, that's required for those BMPs to be cleaned out um, before it potentially affects the groundwater levels below um, or before it becomes too uh, contaminated and affects the discharge that leaves the facilities. Um, a lot of the other contaminants that we do have um, are just trash and debris. Uh, and so all of the inlets um, that lead to our storm drain systems have uh, grates or catch basins with filters um, that capture that runoff or those contaminants um, before they're discharged. And the city of LA maintains and cleans those. Uh, and so they'll clean out the drains, they'll clean out the catch basins um, regularly. Um, that's part of the maintenance requirement for the city of LA. And then on private facilities, it's also a requirement um, that they clean out uh, those catch basins as well. Great, thanks, Oval. So this is a really good segue to the next um, presentation that we're going to host next week. Next week, we'll be talking about safeguarding LA trash or water bodies, which is uh, how we keep all those contaminants from going into our rivers and lakes and creeks and oceans. And uh, next week, we'll have Brett, Perry, uh, Brett and Richard. Um, they will talk about our safe clean water program, the projects that we put all over the city, uh, all over the county uh, to just catch the contaminants from our storm drain system from going into our um, water bodies. So please stay tuned. Um, and uh, before we close out to, to this presentation, please feel free to raise your, your hands if you have any other questions or just um, type in, in the question box. We have a few minutes, a few minutes left um, in our presentation. So All right. Well, with that, um, that concludes our today's tech talk again. Thanks, Sarah and Oval, for an amazing presentation. I hope you learn a lot. And um, again, uh, please hope to. I hope to see um, um, the attendees again on November first. Again, the uh, topic of our discussion next week will be safeguarding LA's treasure water bodies. It will be an interesting discussion on the projects that we put up. Um, so we look forward to Brett and Richard at the next um, Tech Talks. Um, and again, you know, you will be receiving an email if you register with the Eventbrite from us. Um, and the email will have all the information that we have discussed and shared today. So thanks again for attending this presentation and we will see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>